I could hear drums. I could smell something that I would now identify as paupers. And there were loads of men in kilts, which wasn't that unusual in Edinburgh, only these kilts were made of leather and rubber. And there were more lesbians than I knew existed in the entire universe. And there were people kissing and holding hands in public in Edinburgh, which to me just seemed nothing short of revolutionary. I kept expecting the police, and there were lots of police, to come and arrest us, but it didn't happen. We were to march all the way through Edinburgh to the Meadows, which is the bit where everybody has their kind of picnics in the summer, and we were going to have drinks there and dance and, you know, maybe find our actual friends instead of wandering around lost. I remember big handmade banners shouting about AIDS, which had hit Edinburgh very hard. I don't remember what I wore that day, but I do remember that I felt... I had to have at least one red ribbon on. I think I probably had two red ribbons on. And we were marching for the people that we had lost. We were marching with ghosts. There were lots of pink triangles. I was just discovering that part of my history. I'd known about the Jews and the Roma being rounded up by the Nazis, but I didn't know that they'd rounded up LGBTQ plus people as well. So I was learning my own history on that march, even as that march was a part of history. At that time, I was a student at Napier University in Edinburgh. I was studying journalism, the first in my family to go to university. And I did think, oh, maybe I should interview people. Maybe I should, you know, talk to them about this. But I thought, who would run this story? Who's going to care about gay pride? So there's a silence in that archive about my pride in 1995. There's also silence from the first Northern Ireland pride, which was held in 1991. But in 1996, Pride Scotia did make it to the BBC's reporting Scotland. And again, not everybody was happy. It was a case of everyone welcome and... ...part of society. And we demand our right to be a part of society. But although the atmosphere inside the cordoned off area of Glasgow Green was celebratory and friendly, it was definitely not contagious. I don't think it's right. Like, we've got children here and there crawling a bit on the grass and that, so that's why we're walking in the outside of the park. There was a serious side to today's fun. A petition was launched seeking a reform of the Criminal Justice and Sexual Offences Act, calling for more freedom and equal rights for gays and lesbians in Britain. Today, though, no one was holding back. It didn't rain all the time. And I didn't pull, or at least I didn't pull that I remembered. If I did pull, it wasn't very memorable. But that day did change my life. It was the first time that I felt like I was not alone. There were other people like me that I had a past and a present and a future. And it's been the focus of my community's greatest battles. Full decriminalisation of same-sex relationships. An equal age of consent. Healthcare for people with HIV AIDS and PrEP to stop the pandemic. Overturning the pointless and cruel Section 28. Fighting for the right to marry, to adopt, to live and work freely and safely and joyfully. Nancy Kelly is the current Chief Executive of Stonewall, the organisation that's campaigned for LGBT plus equality since McKellen, Power and others helped set it up in 1989. Stonewall has been part of some of the greatest victories of the movement for equality, from doing away with Section 20 partnerships, marriage equality, adoption and protections at home, work and school. I have got such a soft spot for the tiny prides like I love all the highlands and islands prides and stuff like every year I end up crying you know I get really sentimental about it you see these amazing celebratory pictures of these like really small community prides like geographic community prides and you see kind of LGBTQ plus people just being visible and like handing out rainbow pens and there's like 30 or 50 people and they are just taking up space and celebrating who they are and I find that really moving not least because there's an intimacy to that right if I march through the streets of London the likelihood of people seeing me is that know me is like nil right I mean maybe not in this job but every other time I've done it you know if you live in a small community and you are standing on the high street wrapped in a rainbow flag 
everybody you know is going to see you. So there's a real kind of bravery and beauty in those smaller prides that I am always so moved by. There's no doubt that Pride helps to turn the tide against hate in the wider world, but the movement itself does not always represent or support everyone within it. Being gay doesn't stop you being homophobic, racist or transphobic. We are not perfect, we never have been and we never will be. The fact is, none of us are free until all of us are free. And this is part of the reason why different parts of our community are doing what the GLF did in 1972 and starting their own prides. There's food, there's music, and there are plenty of rainbows. This is UK Black Pride. Events like Black Pride show you you can be you, unequivocally, unashamedly, and I'm here for that. People of colour have always been a part of the LGBTQ plus story, but the very first standalone UK Black Pride was in 2005. I had the joy of sitting down and chatting with the indomitable Lady Phil, co-founder and CEO of UK Black Pride. When we talk about wanting to create spaces for ourselves so we can be visible, so we can be brave, so it can feel safe for us, these group of leaders, they laughed, they jeered, and one of them told me to, please excuse my language, to F off and go back to where I came from. We still sound shocked and surprised by this. No, I'm not, that's the thing, I'm depressed. I'm just, it's like, it's kind of bleak. Yeah, but I think the understanding of what I'm trying to say to you is just because we are from marginalised or underrepresented communities, it doesn't make people exempt from being bigots, right? It doesn't stop you from, you know, wanting equality and equity for LGBT plus people, but not necessarily wanting it for black and POC LGBT plus people. We had in 2005, the most amazing pride ever with over 200 people it cost us 477 pounds 27 pence and that was 2005 where you can fast forward to 2019 our very last in-person event although we will be having it this year where we had over 11,000 people <laughs> We make sure that we are completely inclusive in the work that we do at UK Black Pride. And that takes many different forms. And I guess, you know, that advocacy, that grassroots community-led spirit of UK Black Pride is what makes us rich in what we take forward, how we take it forward, and how we are inclusive, not exclusionary, inclusive of our many different communities. Do you have a march? No. You see, we protest every single day. Our life is about protesting. So, you know, we don't necessarily have a march, and maybe that will come. Mm. But I guess it's for the community to tell us what they want. UK Black Pride, how you feel? <laughs> Welcome to UK Black Pride. UK Black Pride means by us and it's for us. And it's exactly what you can see today. Absolutely insane. There are people who see new prides like Black Pride, like Trans Pride, like Asexual Pride, and think there's a problem here, or why do we need these spaces? And I'd like you to talk about that, because I feel like we do need these spaces. I feel like we all need these spaces. Black Pride is not new. We have always had pride in our blackness. What's happened is you may not have seen it because there's spaces that have not been carved out for us. So when they're not carved out for us, we do it ourselves. And that's why we have a black pride, not to justify our existence, not to explain why we need something, but just to be able to live, to survive and thrive Another new pride started down the road from me in Brighton. Trans rights are human rights! Trans rights are human rights! One more time with feeling. 
Trans rights are human rights. Trans Pride is the biggest event of its type in the UK and probably the world. I went to the newly opened Trans Pride Centre whose walls are covered with incredible placards and banners to meet Chief Executive Sarah Savage. Happy Pride! We are the gift. We are valid. We are beautiful. There is nothing wrong with us. Quite the opposite. Everything is right with us. 20... 13. We all came together and we were really annoyed that some trans people had been to Brighton Pride and had faced discrimination. And it felt like a lot of people. Um, so, you know, there were visible trans people. And so, because Brighton Pride is so large, it attracts a lot of people who aren't gay. And so, a lot of those people come and they see a trans person and they're drunk and they shout stuff at them and you, they abuse them in the street, you know? We are trying to help you! We have come here for your salvation, not for your destruction! So, we really wanted a space where we could put the T first in LGBT. And we really wanted to have an event where people felt like they weren't alone because going to a large pride event you can feel quite alone you know and so yeah it exploded from there we had 800 people at our first event and now we planned for about 10,000. You were marching in that first march for trans rights what is it that you're asking for? Equality. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, at, at the moment, trans people are discriminated against when they go for healthcare. There's so many people who are fired or not even hired because they're visibly trans. The current media landscape is also very, very hostile to trans people. There are people who really, really have an ideological problem with the existence of trans people and it's created a media environment and an academic environment of oppression against trans and non-binary people and it's really ramped up over the last five years you know it's you know it's awful i want to ask you now about your first experiences of pride when did you first go to a pride march my first proper Pride march was London Pride, London World Pride 2012, I believe it was. And again, this is, you know, not very long after I first transitioned. I still hadn't found my confidence. And I got invited by Stonewall Housing, a uh, London charity, to march with them. It was just so empowering to be there with a group of friends within, you know, 100,000 other people. And you know, someone gave me a megaphone <laughs> and that moment is where I found my voice and I remember we, we went past Downing Street and gay marriage or equal marriage still wasn't legal back then and I remember shouting through the microphone at Downing Street and that moment really changed everything for me. How, how does it change for you? Like I, I found my voice you know it sounds really cheesy but like I found my confidence it was the most empowering thing I've ever experienced. You know I've been invited to many different prides around the country and the vibe at that London Pride with hundreds of thousand people is exactly the same as the vibe when I went to Hereford Pride and Hereford Pride was less than 10 people in a room in a pub. It's so important this year that we are taking up space, that we are filling the streets, that we are here in all our bright, beautiful, diverse different, the same colourful realness. We are giving it so much and we all look so beautiful. Trans pride is needed because only trans people know how trans people feel and the same with why UK Black Pride is needed because only black people know what it's like to live in this world with the discrimination they face. Primarily and first of all trans pride is a protest. We say every year at the start of the protest march that this is a protest and we have people talking about discrimination and we have people talking about how they can build a better future. And because we start from a protest, it permeates the whole of the event. So while there is a party atmosphere in the park and we're all about positivity and encouragement and empowerment, people still bring their signs. People bring their, their feelings and that permeates everything. So when you have look at our stage acts, they're all trans people and they're all shouting about the issues that matter to them the most. 
Trans Pride has always been organised by volunteers. We've always said no to sponsorship or donations from companies that don't have a brilliant record of support in the trans community. And this has gone on to create what Transpired is today. We're, we're very non-corporate. We're still led by volunteers. And we do not sell out. We're still a free-to-attend event. And I think this is what is really key to Transpired's success is we replicate the same kind of atmosphere that a lot of people have told us that Pride was 30 or 40 years ago. So it's 2010 and the fight is on for same-sex marriage. We've got civil partnerships, but we want equal marriage. And why shouldn't we? Here is Peter Tatchell talking about the extraordinary moment where Boris Johnson was put on the spot by Ben Cohen of Pink News. One of the game changers was Boris Johnson. We were all surprised that Boris turned up to lead the 2010 London Pride Parade. I saw this as a great opportunity to put him on the spot. So I, I scampered through the legs of the press scrum surrounding him, popped up in front of Boris, holding a sign, Dave and Sam Cameron can marry, gays can't. And they'd said to him, look, Boris, you're a libertarian. Will you support same-sex marriage? And he undernarred and fluffed a bit, but eventually he said yes. You, you said you were calling for gay marriage, are you? I think you'd probably be, be conservative for the liberal democracy to get together in a national coalition and settle their differences. And I, I don't see why you've gone and gay marriage. I can't remember the order, but I was there. I think a little bit tipsy from already having some drinks from uh, Pride, but that clip was from my Blackberry, I remember. At that year's Conservative Party conference, David Cameron finally came out in support of equal marriage. Conservatives believe in the ties that bind us, that society is stronger when we make vows to each other and we support each other. So I don't support gay marriage in spite of being a Conservative. I support gay marriage because I am a Conservative. This archive hour is being broadcast on the same day as Pride in London, which is now one of the biggest in the world. But the actual 50th anniversary of Ted and Nettie and Stuart and all their friends and allies taking to the streets was yesterday. And that's when they retraced their original steps from Trafalgar Square to Hyde Park. They marched with Dan Glass of the newly reinvigorated Gay Liberation Front. Since GLF began in 1970 and started Radical Gay Pride in 1972, and its politics are it's astoundingly insightful and rich when it comes to how we organise and change the world for the better for everyone. And now, obviously, we've got the incredible historic moment of the 50th anniversary of the first Gay Pride demonstration on July the 1st. And that's why we're holding the demo. You are here because we were there 50 years of Pride. Pride is both a carnival and a protest on the very same route that it happened 50 years back. And it's been such an honour to be part of it. It's been so informative and really emotional as well. You know, we've got activists speaking from Queer China, Make Poland Queer Again, Middle Eastern queer activists all really paying tribute to the intersectional connections and the ongoing struggle for absolute freedom for all. It's very different to July the 2nd, Pride in London parade. It's very different. You know, I'm in, I'm in total support of all the people who go on Pride in London on the 2nd to be empowered and to feel part of community, but the politics are very different. The story of Pride, from moment to movement, from London to the rest of the UK and around the world and into diverse standalone events, is nothing short of inspiring. It's not perfect, inequality is not evenly experienced, and newly won rights are under attack again, at home and abroad. But it's a different world from the one that Nettie, Ted and Stuart were born into. And that's thanks to them, and thanks to Pride. Pride is a big part of the story being told in the UK's first dedicated LGBTQ plus museum. Queer Britain is just behind King's Cross Station in London and opened its doors to all earlier this year. My name is Joseph Galliano. I'm the director and co-founder of Queer Britain, which is the first national LGBTQ plus museum. My name is Dan Vo, and I'm also at Queer Britain, but I also like to call myself a queerator. So I have been looking at queer history across the sector for a little while in terms of museums and galleries. 
Well, Damien, I'm going to confess to you. My very first Pride March, I had prepared for it. I was working with a LGBTQ plus organization at the time, and I had prepared for it. I'd done the banners for them, made it all ready to go, glittered up, and then I went to the group, I handed over the banners, and then I ran away. I just didn't quite have the courage to actually go through with it. Like, I was a mix of emotions. It was just... I really desperately wanted to, but then when I got there and had a look around, I just went, oh, is this for me? Can I really do this? Is this the place for me to be? And I think that's the thing. Like, I think when we're there, and I have since marched with a galleries, libraries, archives, museums group, that's a glam group, of course, where we've been a conglomerate of all sorts of different museums from across the country marching. and. You're basically there with a bunch of nerds. <laughs> and to have a place where I knew that I did belong there was so important and so affirming. And that's what led me to kind of do the first Pride here in London. And so I think that's what I always think of when we're, we're doing things. You know, there's always going to be a scared kid that isn't sure about whether they do belong. But when they find the group around them who says, no, you do belong here, that's the important thing. A large portion of the history of LGBTQ plus people has been one of erasure. Sometimes systematic, sometimes accidental, but it's been a big part of the problem. And it's why Pride was so important, why it was so important that people gathered together and were seen and were visible, and furthermore, that they're documented, they're archived, they're sh it's shown that their stories are important and that literally they have been seen. As I stand in the museum and see people come through, I recognize that there's this, there's this like spark that just lights up in their eyes. They have been yearning to have their history marked, to be recognized. And I think that when you sort of look at pride, that's what, in a blink of an eye as it marches past you, that's what's happening as well. People are yearning to be recognized and applauded just for being them. One of the things that really highlights that point is that most days, at least one person will come in and burst into tears. And the reason that they burst into tears generally is one of joy at being seen. If we're still celebrating Pride in 50 years time, I think what that could represent is the necessary vigilance that is needed to make sure that while rights can move in one direction, they can also move in another direction as well. We've got centuries of history. You go right back to Celtic Britain and you'll find queerness there. You'll find us there. And there is so many centuries of history that shows us that sometimes the pendulum swings towards us, sometimes it goes away from us. And so there is a, a need to constantly be aware of what's going on, what's happening. There are so many rights to fight for right now. And I would love if in 50 years they were one, but then you kind of also ask, do we have full equality? Do we have equity as well? Do we have we covered for everybody? And I think as long as there still remains one person that we need to fight for, we should carry on. I like them black gays. I like them white gays. I like them Asian gays. I like them mixed race gays. Standing together, marching together because of our differences, not in spite of them. We have achieved dramatic legal, social and cultural change. We've done a huge amount, but there's so much more to do. Yes, I can now get married and adopt if I want to. I can get a mortgage and complain about it. I can no longer be fired or evicted just for being gay. Two things that happened to me before the law was changed. But these benefits still aren't shared equally by every part of the community. And the law can go backwards as well as forwards. Roe v. Wade has just been overturned and equal marriage is next. We know it is and if it can happen there, it can happen here or it can happen anywhere.